the evil trees of heresy adding more of their, usual, evil fruits, 26 March, 2024 Anno Domini. Official publication of the Holy Apostolic See of Rome, in exile, by His Holiness Pope Jacobus I, exposing and condemning the evil fruits and scandalous opinions and manifestly intended omissions of the already, ipso facto and declared by the Holy See, excommunicated heretics, including, but not limited to, the apostate sectarians of the novice ordo sect, and the heretics of SSPX, SSPXMC, SSPV, and the set of Akintist heretics, for their scandalous evil heretical opinions, fabricated false doctrines and canonical inventions, and for their misleading assertions, by which these collaborators of Satan are always active in the service of their master the devil, them luring countless unwitting souls into their perverted assemblies and conventicles, only to collect personal data on them and pervert them into the heresies of these enemies of the Catholic Church, supplying these souls to the tyrannical yoke of the devil, for more evils yet to come to them, all were warned about these heretics and them being outside the Catholic Church, so that there is no excuse nor ignorance possible. So today we would like to present uh, another publication of both excerpts of, uh, at least we have three ready as it is, of uh, these notorious heretics and they represent three sections of their, of these heretical assemblies. So one of them is uh, this illegitimate so-called order of uh, society of the ten. The other one is uh, sort of a contest, sort of privationist heretic Donald J. Stanborn. And then the third will be uh, the uh, society of the fifth illegitimate order, notorious heretic, all excommunicated, it's a facto, and by our declaration from May of 2021 Anna Domini, full of excommunication, uh, especially reserved to the Holy See, to our decision, uh, if they so choose to, choose to finally become Catholic. Uh, and that's uh, William Jenkins from this society of the fifth illegitimate order again, that was never approved by the church. So let us go to the first one because uh, we have a lot to do. And so this is remarkable. Uh, uh, the SSPX heretics actually explicitly uh, it's it's on that uh, uh, on that video. We'll show it. Uh, it's showing the we have just con condemned it as, uh, under anathema uh, the Novosoto so-called liturgy, and so they actually began to say explicitly and publicizing it. And this video we don't re recall when actually this was published. May have been a year ago. They actually explicitly says that to them the Novosoto mockery of God is valid. They sang. So it will be shown. So let us go to that and we'll comment on it uh, momentarily. And then the SSPX heretics, and it is not any better here either. Stay away always. This, this new mass is, is a gravely insufficient worship. Um, the reformers were not seeking to honor our Lord and, and uh, renew the sacrifice of Calvary. Or, or if at best they were um, trying to do it in the most minimalistic way possible. Okay, so it says uh, right there underneath, under him, they call it mass, it's not. So this is this person, is uh, his name is Robinson. He's from the SSPX, Heretics. And so they even have that logo over there. So uh, that's, uh, they're just saying it's insufficient, but that's not sufficient to say. That's, that's a heresy, and it involves heresy. So let's, let's go to what they say, what he says, because it, it confirms that what he, what he says is, again, a heretical, uh, heretical falsehood. So uh, they're just spreading this around to, uh, to cause more harm. And what will take, what will happen next? Will I actually begin to say it? That's, that's a Protestant reenactment of the Last Supper. It's completely invalid. And, so to say, this is anathema. Leave the door open for it to be a Protestant worship service. Um, so they definitely succeeded in doing that. And the problem is that because the Novus Ordo Mass errs so much by omission, it leaves so much out, and uh, it's no longer uh, authentically re uh, um, representing 
the, the Catholic faith, um, it is a serious danger to our faith. That if we, if we, we know, we know from the past 50 years, that if you go to the Novus Ordo Mass on a regular basis, um, there's a grave danger of you losing your faith. Um, so that's why in that, in that um, podcast we did in the Crisis in the Church series, we, we just can't recommend that people go to it. Um, why go to that when you know why it was made what a danger it is to your eternal salvation when you have um, the traditional Mass available to you, which we know, again, from history, hundreds of years, that this is that Mass has sanctified the faithful and uh, has produced so many saints. This is our degree of uh, condemnation of the, uh, of the ceremony, as it is. But what he said is, is remarkable because, and we have to address it again, what he says is that they cannot recommend it, but he's never nowhere saying that he said this Protestant is close to it. It's just he doesn't say it explicitly that it is truly Protestant and not going to the Last Supper. But it was Montini who invited six Protestants and God knows how many more to co- collaborate on, on establishing it in 1969. They, they pushed it through and Montini was never elected Pope. So he was not a valid Pope because by then they were heretics because of the changes to the sacraments in 1962. Because Ron Kahl, his, so, his predecessor, who was validly elected to the papacy, we have shown that many times, uh, his picture when he was allowed to into the conclave, so uh, uh, after, in 1958, after Christ the Twelve died. And so, otherwise, if he was a heretic already back then, that would prevent him to, to go, but there was no proof of him being heretic. So, obviously, Ron Kahl was allowed, and then they elected him. Whether there were any regalities, that doesn't apply because he was finally, it was never contested really that he would, at that time, so not what they think today, the heretics, but at that time it was so uh, the church elected him and that's it. Whether they were already enemies of the church, they were, they were making sure that they are not visible, so they wanted to obtain the papacy. But then they started using it for evil purpose, so he severed himself by publishing a heretical and invalid so then I'll pontificar Romanum uh, especially when he attacked the right of episcopal consecration where he changed it and made it invalid by imposition of hands in turn of those three bishops which is the essential moment of that uh, consecration taking place and, and on that account he severed himself from the papacy because it's a direct attack on the, on the apostolic succession of the church we have presented it many times in our publication so this is the decree, so they can read it, what it is, it's a Novus Ordo Liturgy and Innovations. It's not a liturgy, it's just, it's, it's just completely invalid, because, so this is what we wanted to show, as the canon. Uh, if anyone, and that whole video is available, it's uh, on our platforms and so forth. If anyone said that the Novus Ordo Liturgy is valid, New order liturgy is valid in any way, or that it could obtain or is capable of being valid. And if anyone said that the Novus Ordo ceremony could be called Novus Ordo Mass, let him be anathema. I mean, cursed and excommunicated, because it is it is not the Mass, and it can never be called Mass because when we say Mass, that means holy sacrifice of the Mass, and that has to be that is Catholic Mass, and that is solely and only the Tridentine Mass. In Latin language, prior to these changes for the Roncalli Institute, so what SSPX, what this person was saying that about that liturgy, that they do not have it because there's substantial change in the canon of that of that missile which Roncalli Institute is. So it's invalid because it came after in time table. It came after he severed himself from the papacy, and so there's there's no no comparison. There's no no possible way to admit it as anything like this. So, in, in fact, that 1962 Missile Romanum is invalid because so they, they cannot be used. And if they using it for celebrating it, that invalidates not only their, their Mass, because that's a new, new sacrament, because they put St. Joseph in the canon of the Mass. And but in that prayer, it speaks about apostles and martyrs. But St. Joseph was neither martyr, neither apostle. So that has a serious heretical implications so they cannot be admitted into the canon of the mass moreover that's that's not according to tradition so saint joseph was never named in the canon of the mass 
not to diminish from him, but that's Roncalli did it on purpose to invalidate the whole thing. But it is a serious defect of intention. It invalidates ordinations and episcopal consecration because then they, they would celebrate that thing in the 1962 form that goes all the way back to Archbishop of Ever. They would attempt to celebrate it. In that case, yes, they would sever themselves uh, they would, that uh, so-called ordination because that, that's the defect of intention part of that ordaining priest, uh, ordaining bishop and uh, the, the one who is being ordained to priesthood because they, that's not, that's according to our process of blessed memory uh, Leo XIII, Apostolic Aquaria, condemning the Anglican rights, uh, Anglican rights, because that's the same principle. You cannot change the actual what the Church uses for sacraments and then present it as uh, what they will celebrate at the ordination. Uh, because with that knowledge that they will exclusively celebrate the 1962 Missal using the 1962 Missal that invalidates or makes defect of intention and that's invalid ordination because that's not what the church does. We do not celebrate the 1962 uh, because there is, there is serious the defect. And Ron Kai, what he did, he excommunicated himself because of Council of Trent, Session 7, Canon 13, and sacraments in general. So we have shown this many, many times before, but then people don't want to hear it uh, and they just want to continue in their errors then they end up in uh, being outside the church that's right here council of strength session 7 canon 13 on sacraments in general if anyone said that the, that the received and approved rites of the catholic church want to be used in the solemn administration of the sacraments may be condemned or without sin be omitted at pleasure by the by the ministers or be changed by every pastor of the churches into other new ones let him be anathema it's cursed it's communicated so obviously there's no such thing as introducing something like this a missile that contains these changes that in fact invite heresy and are substantial changes and that's what Ron Kali did that's how he severed himself from the papacy and not only that he was already outside the church and lost the papacy because of what he did to, in the Portico Romano we are demonstrating that many times before. Uh, so, uh, we will play another video, uh, another excerpt, and uh, then comment on it. The ipso facto, and declared by the Holy See, excommunicated set of Akintist heretic Donald J. Sanborn, here involved, once more and over again, in heretical denial of the proper constraints of the valid code of canon law, the 1917 code, and by implying that, since he and his set of Akintist assembly of heretics claims to be the true Catholic Church's remnant, that they still don't have the canonical standing and authority in regards to judicial and magisterial continuation of the Catholic Church, and so he is purposely deceiving his followers into conclusions that are harmful and even heretical, as then who would have the proper and valid ecclesiastical authority, the novice ordo apostate sect of communist agents? Or the other heretics? whom Sanborn is not naming heretics at all. Stay away as far as possible from these servants of the devil. So, we would like to add some more to it. Because what you're about to hear is a very important part and it's fairly long, uh, extra about eight minutes left now, and a little over eight. But we will let it play. We have to. We had to cut some parts out of it because it was just uh, this. And then he says something that was outrageous. It was a live stream. These people are very well connected. But not only that, but then he, what he says in the course is leading into heresy because then he he doesn't say it explicitly, but implicitly it's implied. It, it's implied in there that he speaks about dioceses and all this. Please read the inscription on there, what we have put in there, because that shows at that exact point what he says and what is wrong with it. Because the Novus Ordo sect is not part of the church, so you cannot imply anything about diocese, because the church, Roman Catholic Church, we don't have any dioceses anymore, because there's nobody there who would, the, the, the whole property is occupied by non-Catholic sect. Uh, so you cannot call them dioceses anymore. 
they cannot we don't call them dioceses because the, there's no the structure of church is damaged by these heretics and they don't belong with the church so then obviously they don't belong with the structure that the church is using in normal times yes in normal times there would be a true bishop there and diocese and in charge of the diocese and the pastor of the of the church in and the or three four churches doesn't matter and uh on that parish and that will be it if yeah, that's not the case today so he but he's not allowing that he's not explaining it what the situation is uh, so and not no matter how that stands or who understands if some and then there's other outrageous things that he says we, we will stop the tape and stop the we say tape stop the recording and uh and uh, comment on it at that moment but this is this is one of the worst kind of examples when the enemies of the church the servants of satan when they get open doors what they are capable of doing so uh, let's go to the first uh, example okay <laughs> no don't watch movies but definitely don't watch this movie well i turned it off at that point <laughs> <laughs> um in relation to this, uh, Your Excellency, and I, I know there's a super chat. I will get to it in a moment. I just want to stay on this on this line. What are the bans, and does the Institute publish marriage bans? Uh, the uh, bans of marriage are the announcements made in the parish of each of the persons who are about to get married, asking for any objections to the fact that they should be married. Uh, and it was done three times in, in uh, as you go went up to the date of marriage each each Sunday, and uh, so that was to um, make sure that the there was no impediment that the church didn't know about you know what the would be previous a marriage a previous marriage or uh, some other you know immorality or something that would be useful to know, uh, and uh, so. Uh, but that is required only in parish churches. We do not operate parish churches. We operate stables in a storm. There is a place where people can go to mass. We don't have any, uh, we're not pastors, assigned pastors by the bishop of the diocese or anything like that. So we are not required to do it. And furthermore, it seems because sometimes people are, you know, if you're marrying somebody from Australia, for example, it seems a little odd to be <laughs> announcing it. Uh, when I was a young priest, we used to do it. But uh, it just seemed uh, pointless at a, at a certain point. So, but I mean, you know, if, if a priest wants to do it, that's fine. Uh, it, that's it's just something as far as the Institute looks at it. These aren't parishes. They're just mass centers. And therefore, yes. this is a prerogative of a parish. Yes. All right. So to comment on this, it, it is important to comment on this. Because obviously the, the person doesn't really realize what he's saying. Because the situation is different, it warrants better answer, much much more uh, direct answer. So if they call themselves the remnant of the church, then yes, they would have to use that authority if they were showing and standing with the church. But they are not, so that's true. They are not. They are heretics. He's he's outside the church. So then, yes, he would be that parish as far as as matter of necessity. Uh, because of the continuation of the church. So yes, then he would be in charge of these things. They would have to do it. He's bound to do it by canon law. So this not, where would that, so he's taking out of context and purposely and denies the canon law. The constraints on the canon law apply to all who continue the church as it is, who are part of the church. So if he's a religious order and there is no other, let's say he would be by himself in a religious order, that would be the only one who goes standing with the church, that he would be bound to to do that. That's that's required. So what he's saying is 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 not only leading into heresy. It is heretical because he's denying the authority of the church that put it in place. The nothing something called of canon law. So the bans of marriage have to be there, and plus he doesn't have valid marriages as a heretic. This is that's just simply impossible. And yes, he's not. And uh, as, a, as a pastor, as a, because the, the canon law is specific, but it, in, in the sense of the, if, if he was in good standing and there was no other, yes, he would have to do it as it is. And in that case, yes, he would have valid marriages. He would have received the faculty, the permission of, of the church and all this. But this is not, yeah, they are outside of, of the church. He's excommunicated heretic. 
So he doesn't even understand what, what needs to be said. How exactly it has to be explained according to the constraints of the canon law. But the valid code of canon law is in 1917. I don't know many kind of code of canon law. So no, this is absolutely and it's it is incredible what he says. No, it's it's an obligation of the parish. Obligation. Yes. And another example, and yes, it leads to heresy because of the evidently deliberate omission of the fact when this heretic Sanborn is using the term quote diocese unquote, it cannot be applied to the novice ordo apostate sect as they have no Catholic dioceses and no jurisdiction nor any authority nor membership in the Roman Catholic Church. So then Sanborn is silent about this essential point, which he, if he was a true Catholic bishop, would know that he has the obligation to teach. And it is a heresy to let it stand as this. Does the Institute engage in exorcisms? If you mean solemn exorcisms, uh, no. Uh, what is a solemn exorcism? It's one saying? that is authorized by the bishop of the diocese and a, an exorcist, that means a, a priest, is chosen with the faculties to do it. And uh, so, that, I mean, that, that's uh, something we don't do. We, we're, we don't have a bishop of the diocese. And, and, uh, but there are many private exorcisms that are done. In it, it truly begs the, begs the question, and um, we have inscribed it there, and we will read it because it's much quicker. So then the question is, will you not drive the devil from the soul if that soul is willing to be truly Catholic? Who then would do so if you are not willing? The truth is that these heretics cannot obtain this grace from God, and without our Lord's help, the, the devil remains where he likes to be, inside the souls of such and such like heretics. And, but that's not even... But he's addressing again, he says that somehow all of a sudden he doesn't have authority to, to do exorcism. But what he says is not exactly true. It's, it's not exactly according to the truth. Why? Because in the, uh, in the Solemn, the Solemn exorcism is investments and it's according to the authority, it's reserved to the priest. But he has to have the faculty of the church, that's true. But we have already explained that what it means to have the faculty in, in the in the extraordinary times he would have the he if he was good standing yes he would have the faculty on on, on that on that account uh, but exorcism is a very difficult task and, and very pain, uh, painful very very um, it may not even be successful as it is but there's this requirement and that was history of the Sanborn because his so-called consecrator was, his name was McKenna. He was supposedly uh, exorcist, but there's a, there's a video, and we have used it in one of us, our older publications to illustrate that really the, uh, the, uh, how these heretics operate. And uh, so there was a case of somebody from the uh, United Kingdom who was not even Catholic, and he supposedly came to this McKenna. McKenna accepted him, but that's drive the devil from that person you can repel the devil away from that soul but then he will write back in it if that was a soul of a heretic somebody who's not catholic so that's required also valid confession of course you cannot go to confess you cannot allow somebody who is not catholic to to go to confession he has to convert does uh does uh does required procedure as it is that's canon 731 we'll show it real quick uh, is forbidden to minister the sacraments of the church to heretics and schismatics even though they are in good faith and ask for them unless they have first renounced their errors and have been reconciled to the church what it means to be in good faith that means that they have learned the uh, the remains of faith they are ready to go but that's the ceremony has to be uh, there and they have to solemnly promise that they will obey the church and so forth so it's, it's, a, it's a prescribed 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 ceremony that has to take place and so and they have to raise their right hand and and, and promise that they will that they will obey the church and, and follow and so forth so um, even though they are in good faith and ask for them that means that they are if they otherwise they would be uh permitted to to obtain the sacraments but heretics cannot cannot confer this there's just, just simply no no possibility so um we have demonstrated this uh, 
many times there are these heretics uh, they don't have any regard for the for the canon law they avoid even applying it properly and then when he speaks that they would not be doing exorcism the solemn exorcism if he was in good standing again with the church he would have that faculty he would be actually required to if, if, if it was if it was determined that exorcism is necessary yes he would be required to do it obliged to do it for that soul to, to, to protect that soul to drive the devil away and, but totally upside down totally upside down that's why he's outside the church excommunicated in baptism for example and other times um, there was even the private exorcism of leo the 13th that you could uh like if you suspected say that somebody was possessed by the devil uh in the confessional you could recite the that you know, as a private exorcism and private meaning simply that it wasn't subject to witnesses no just that it is not it is distinguished from the public in other words where you have the bishop of the diocese intervening hmm. you see it's just uh that's typically in in baptism is exorcism other places you uh, holy water is exorcism right Good morning. Are you able to recommend a validly ordained priest for confession, spiritual direction for my father who is elderly, who has been hospitalized numerous times in the last few months, and is a daily mass attendee of the Novus Ordo? Extreme unction is not something familiar to the clergy at a Catholic hospital. I pray for his soul. He is in Pennsylvania. Dear Mr. So-and-so, please rest assured of our prayers for your father. If he was a daily Novus Ordo mass attendee, he should go to the Novus Ordo clergy for the sacraments. So now, this is, this, we have written it that, so you can read it. But we want to comment on it. What he's saying, he's reading uh, uh, an email, apparently, or some kind of communication, from a person whose father is uh, attending the Novus Ordo mockery of God and abomination and so forth. And then he says that if, whether there is any way to... So then uh, we have just shown it, canon, yes. He has to have the finger. If he goes to, there's no such possibility. What Sanborn doesn't do, he's answering mostly correctly, but what he doesn't do is uh, he doesn't say, oh, he wrote that to send him to send him back. This is somebody who's under Sanborn. They even name him the name for constraint of time. We have to, we have to shorten it. But uh, he, that's the reply from that from that minister, so-called minister, because he's not a priest. They don't have priests. Um, because where Sanborn comes from and, and all that, uh, Archbishop Go, all those difficulties, all those uh, defects of intention and so forth, having phone on the altar and so forth. So that's, that's just no way. And the proofs are there. And we cannot have used, he was able to exercise somebody from, from the UK who was not even Catholic, and they presented it at some kind of valid thing and so forth. So it's uh, the devil probably went away just to protect that lie that it was much more profitable for the devil to just leave one soul to be for a while so that it would look like that he was truly that it was successful so that the to show that uh that that course of set of accountism that heresy of set of accountism is something that they they uh, that that could be followed or something like that that this is something that could easily happen but that's not what the church says about it. See, so there has to be valid confession, and to go to valid confession, you have to be truly Catholic. And you have to go to somebody who has the faculty who's not excommunicated heretic for that confession to be valid. So, because uh, uh, otherwise, it results from grace. God, God will not supply the divine grace for that person to be validly absolved. So, this, you can be confessing to somebody who's a heretic, but then there's no, no validity of that sacrament because God is the one who supplies the necessary grace for that. And he will not do it to those who are his enemies and was, who are not free, priests and so forth. It's, it's, a, it's a horrifying situation. So we will let it play, but just wanted to make sure that these people are misleading and purposely it's, it's intentional because it's manifestly visible because he's omitting important parts of that what needs to be said. That the Novus Ordo sect, when somebody goes to Novus Ordo sect, that means that there's a perverted soul, he's apostate, he's not Catholic, and therefore there's no such thing as admitting somebody into the sacrament. What Sanborn says during that reply on that, 
is again insufficient. That's why we have read he has to be reconciled and there has to be recitement of that formula that's like a page and a half long and that promise, solemn promise with raised hand and hand left hand on the, on the Holy Scripture. That's how uh, it's done and on the Holy Gospel, so yeah, all that. And it has to be done properly. That's how, and it has to be, there has to be a record made of it and, and so forth. So it's, it's not just simply say that somebody shows up and be examined and all this. And then it has to be conditional baptism in regards to the novice or sect. That's our decree because that's that's the same uh, situation as, as the church always used in terms of, of in regards to the Protestants. Because there's no way to verify that they were validly well, baptized, so they cannot be you know, they cannot be trusted. You can you cannot play with that in regards to admission on the, in the, into the church. So we'll play this 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 more. Dedication to giving traditional and valid sacraments is to traditional Catholic laity. Should your father understand that the Novus Ordo is an imposter, perversion of the true Catholic faith, and repudiate it, then we would be most happy to go to wherever he is and bring him the sacraments. So this segues into the question, is it true that the Roman Catholic Institute won't give the last rites to Novus Ordites, and what would be the reasoning? Yes, we do not give uh, last rites to Novus Ordites because you have to understand that the Novus Ordo is an amalgam, you might say, of Catholic structure, but a new religion. See, they have inserted themselves into the Catholic structure, so they retain the name Catholic. Uh, but it's a whole new religion, uh, different from the Catholic religion, in other words, the Catholic faith. Uh, it is, and it is modernism, which is the worst of all of the heresies to assail the church according to St. Pius X. So it's worse than Protestantism, worse than Arianism, worse than all, everything else that the church has had to deal with. It's absolutely the worst. So now people uh, who accept that are in a different religion. They might be in good conscience there. I'm not judging their conscience. It's just that our role is to give sacraments to people who are prepared. And the preparation would be to reject, first of all, the Novus Ordo, and then to be instructed in the true Catholic faith. So when people come to us from the Novus Ordo for Mass, for example, we do not give them sacraments until they are at least instructed in the basics of, of the Catholic faith. Well, who knows what they think or know, you see? And so the, the instruction is always... Uh, a necessary preparation for reception of the sacraments. We don't give Holy Communion to little kids that have not been instructed. They have to be examined for their catechism, for example. The same with confirmation. They have to be instructed. We don't give out confirmation the way you would give out candy. You see, So the same thing is true of Novus Ordoites returning, that they must um, uh, repudiate the Novus Ordo and, and embrace the traditional. Uh, and that is not to say, again, that they're in bad conscience or they're evil people. It's just that they're, they're, they we're dealing with two different things here, two different religions. And it, it, because Protestants could be in good conscience too. They might... No, no. That, that's why we wrote this to Harris, what he says. St. Paul says in Ephesians, uh, it's right here. Ephesians chapter 4. One body and one spirit, as you are called in one hope of your vocation. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. So, one body means one church, and one faith means Catholic tradition, nothing else. So what he says, again, that's a heresy. There's just simply no way that you can insinuate something like this, or actually say it, he said it ex explicitly, Heretic is not in good conscience by the very fact that he's a heretic in front of God. He's not justified. That he violates the Council of Trent, the teaching of the Council of Trent on justification. You, you cannot be justified in front of God when you are a heretic. So the, the, there's, uh, there's no excuse and there's no such thing as, as ignorance because the truth is visible. Seek and you shall find. It's, it's not like... Uh, that is hidden or something, or purposely hidden, no. So what he said is a heresy, that's a heresy. That's a proof, it's just that it does not being, the guidance of the Holy Ghost is not with him. So it's, 
it's it's visible that these people are deceiving and he is has been around long enough to know the truth and therefore this has to be classified as intentional because otherwise there's just simply no, no possibility he would be this ignorant what he said about the protestants or the novels or the sectarians there's no such thing as good conscience in them no they are loaded with sins they are full of heresy it's, it's a heresy so that's not good conscience in front of god that's not excusable or anything that's why the, the, the procedure of the of the church how they are admitted if they if we have explained what it means in good faith that means that they have to be reconciled with the church and not only do they have to be yes they have to be tested in regards to catechism examined and their their individual cases have to be examined what is the obstacles to their admission and so forth because there could be other things bodily piercing bodily tattoos uh scandalous life uh use of uh control substance or alcoholism all these kind of things that they have to be clear of all this and cleansed of all this and so there's no admission of such people into the church period or connection to non-catholic sect or connection to enemies of the church like being secret communists or socialists or atheists in, in a sense and just trying to intrude uh infiltrate the church and and cause harm so this all has to be taken into account he's just saying we at least they have to at least be examined but we have shown the the, the canon law that's that's not the case they have to be reconciled at the church that's a that's a prescribed procedure that he's to follow and he's violating that canon law in the romanum and recorded there and he has to be followed period there's no no way around it so yeah that's why he's a heretic be quote unquote pious Protestants, you know. The uh, it's it's simply to say that there must be instruction before there are sacraments. So that's why we have that policy, you know. And some people don't understand it because, well, he's Catholic. He's a baptized Catholic. He wants to be Catholic, but that for them that's merely a a, a cloak on 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 a false religion. That name they don't really deserve the name of Catholic. Uh, and again, it's not to cast any any sort of criticism toward the person who's sick it's just to say that in fact and and uh, objectively it's two different religions i had sent you a message this week about easter duty and someone had intimated that if uh, i'll just read the question here are sick people obliged to make their easter duty answer the sick and feeble who cannot come to church must inform their pastor so as to have holy eucharist brought to them no one is exempt from making the Easter duty. Yes, I mean, that's the law. Yeah. So are, would you be expecting to get a number of phone calls after this stream from people who would expect us to? Well, again, we're not their pastors, mm. you see. The, uh, that, that's a canon law thing, you see. So uh, the, our obligation is one of charity, not of justice. If you are the pastor of a parish, you have an obligation in justice. justice. We have an obligation in charity. So if somebody calls us from Wyoming and, you know, please drive out and give me the sacraments, that might be impossible for us, you see. So we have shown this before. Uh, yes, so no, no, such, no such thing as uh, whom he calls uh, that he has, they have to go to pass, they, are, they excommunicate, that there's no such thing as dioceses or, or parishes anymore. The church is diminished in numbers and greatly diminished uh, that's just this uh, he's not even saying any of this it's uh, that it is forbidden it says forbidden to minister the sacraments of the church to heretics and schismatics he's not even quoting our canon law and unless they have first been renounced their their errors and been reconciled to the church they have to be admitted Otherwise, they, they cannot. There's, there's no no possibility of uh, of um, being admitted. So now we have shown uh, Sanborn, and uh, now we go to the last culprit, and that's Jenkins, and that's a little bit tricky publication. We admit uh, we had a little bit of difficulty just to put it together and all this not because of technical means but because of what he's saying actually because it's just uh 
these people are afraid that they will get caught in in uh, in these evils, and so they are more careful because this is the the person that we shown. So it's as explicit as that they saying that the novice out of and, and whatever it says underneath that arrow shows to it. That's Gorbachev in his speech in Uzbekistan, so that's the communist. That's uh, Council of Trent. And this is it right here. So, SSPX recently, Palm Sunday, Palm Dominico, just recently. So, they had horrible vestments. All of a sudden, they have these kind of vestments showing uh, there's a perverted cross on them. But there's no ornaments or anything, so all of a sudden something like this happened. Which, uh, again, we don't know what exactly they are doing, but uh, and that's desecrated, that not properly consecrated church to begin with. So that's not a church; that's just a place where they gather and they have idolatry on the front face of the altar. There's a human heart showing there, has to be crossed, and then they have right above the altar on the wall, on the back wall, they have. Uh, uh, representation of an animal, a lamb, which is not Christ our Lord, and it's forbidden by the church to use that kind of representation since the Second Council of Nice, how that's 787 Anno Domini. This in itself, we have probably shown this, but uh, this is from the inscription about the, the Missal, the Lady Missal, it says the explanation about the Mass, the vestments. And uh, so it says, in the embroidery, a cross was marked upon the back of the chasuble and two stripes representing a pillar on the front to designate that the priests and the people should carry their cross after Christ and lean for support upon the church, which St. Paul calls the pillar of truth. This chasuble exhibiting the cross upon the priest's back shows how after the purple garment was thrown upon his shoulder and the rumors of um, so forth. Just that to show that there was there's a cross on the back of the vestments. So because they were not exhibiting that, obviously. They carry all kinds of vestments as it is. We have shown this. That's the excommunication count 2314, so it's reserved to the Holy See. Uh, and then there's a, from uh, Leo XIII of Prince of Silver's memory, that's from Satis Cognitum, 1896, Anno Domini. And uh, Leo XIII says, also Augustine says, unbelievers think that the Christian religion will last for a certain period in the world and will then disappear, but it will remain as long as the sun, as long as the sun rises and sets, that is, as long as this, the ages of time shall roll, the Church of God, that is the true Catholic, Roman Catholic Church, not the Novus Ordo Sacrae, not the Church of God, the true body of Christ on earth, will not disappear. And in another place, the church will totter if its foundation shakes, but how can Christ be moved? Christ remaining immovable if the church shall never be shaken. If the church shall never be shaken. Where are they that say that the church has disappeared from the world, when it cannot even be shaken? And that's from St. Matthew, chapter 16. And I say to thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will, build, will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give to thee the keys to the, of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind upon earth, it shall be bound also in the heavens, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth, it shall be loosed also in the heavens. That's the teaching of the authority of the sovereign pontiff. We have shown this already. And so we will go to that next excerpt, which is uh, quite remarkable as it is, because in itself it, uh, it shows the, uh, the wickedness of these people, and especially Jenkins when he was capable of saying such things. So we will go with it and then comment on it. And then comes the ipso facto, and declared by the Holy See, excommunicated SSPV heretic William Jenkins, God help us. And the, the Gospel tells us that when our Lord had tasted that bitter hyssop, he would not drink from it, only tasted it. And there's a symbolic 
meaning there for that. And that is, that bitterness would come to our Lord's lips. And yes, he would taste that bitterness, as he did, coming into this life, into this world. And he tasted the bitterness in our hearts, the bitterness of our sins and our betrayal. Our Lord tasted that, but he would not drink of it. He would not take it in and swallow it. He would not take it into himself. He would not take it into his mind or his heart. Our Lord would taste of that bitterness of our sins, and yet he would not let it enter into him and become any part of him. It had no place in him, that bitterness. And you and I need to look at that example of our Lord crucified with the sponge of that bitterness pressed against his mouth as the world wants us to take that in, to drink of that bitterness, and to fill our minds and our hearts with that same bitterness. A bitterness that fills hell, and a bitterness that also has corrupted the world. And the question is, will you and I, tasting of the bitterness as we do, living in this valley of tears, will we open our mouths, will we drink that in? Will we take that bitterness into ourselves, into our minds, and into our hearts? Ask our Lord for the grace to see that example of him. Whenever you are tempted to bitterness, bitterness of mind or heart, whenever you're tempted to take in that bitterness, ask our Lord to remind you of that moment when he hung on the cross, and yes, he tasted that bitterness all too well, but he would not drink of it. Ask our Lord to remind you of the necessity of keeping that bitterness out of your mind, keeping that bitterness out of your heart, that you not be corrupted, that you not be perverted by the bitterness of the world, which was perverted by the bitterness of hell itself. Ask our Lord for the grace to have your hearts and minds filled with other things, filled with him, filled with the knowledge of him, filled with the love of him, filled with the confidence in his love for you, so that no bitterness may ever corrupt your mind, may ever fill your heart. Ask our Lord and our Blessed Lady, ask our Blessed Lady in her immaculate heart, wounded by that sword that passed through it when our Lord died on the cross, we have to admit something. Uh, he's reading things. He's got a piece of paper. That's not the Holy Ghost in, in, in him. There's just simply no guidance. So he's struggling for expressions to demonstrate a single point that he already demonstrated about 10 times already. That's too much brilliantness. Yes. But what does it mean? How you continue in the... He, then he compares it with, the, with Christ our Lord on the cross uh, that they gave him to drink uh, and he would not drink. But how is it applicable to today's situation? What does it was the edifying part for those who hear the sermon and are supposed to take that edifying part and apply it to their actions? Let's go to Our Lady and, and ask her for grace. These people cannot obtain anything from God. They are his enemies. They are heretics. He's got idolatry on the front face of the altar. That lamb and then a presentation of a, of a, of a dove on, on the front of the, of the tabernacle. So and that's why he's struggling for words because obviously he, they, they are not afraid to say things, but they had... They had they were caught in, in a lie, in a heretical lie. And this Holy See will continue defending the faith, which is Catholic tradition, nothing else. Catholic faith is Catholic tradition, solely and only. Everything else is heresy. And so these people are exposed. And so they are obviously striving to hide themselves so that they could not be exposed even more. So they str he's struggling, virtually struggling with that. Sermon. That's, that's, that's evident and visible that he's struggling for words and he cannot find them. God is not helping him. And he's got pages, page in, uh, a paper in front of him and he's just continues repeating bitterness. There's just too much bitterness. 
That's all we have heard so far. So let's go a little further with this. Ask our Blessed Mother also to keep your heart free from all bitterness. May also be filled with that same devotion, so filled that there is no room for any of the bitterness of the world, for any of the bitterness of hell. Ask our Lord to preserve you from that, to preserve you for heaven. And I close by mentioning just one thing. It occurred to me the other day that there is one statement that the priest makes more than any other thing that he says in his entire life. There is one statement that he, that he expresses, one wish that he expresses, and it's the, the one thing he says more than anything else that he ever says. More than he says hello or goodbye, more than he says the, custom, the customary things for people to say in their lives, the priest says this, may the body of our Lord Jesus Christ preserve your soul unto, guard your soul unto everlasting life. That is the one statement the priest says more than anything else in life. Even here, for example, at Immaculate Conception, the priest who offers the Sunday Mass and gives Holy Communion to the students here during the weekdays. He says, at any given Sunday here, upwards to 500 times, he says, may the body of our Lord Jesus Christ guard your soul under everlasting life. To each one to whom he gives Holy Communion, the priest addresses those words and expresses that wish. And he, he's not just saying words. He's aware of what he's saying, and that is the prayer that he offers for each one who receives our Lord worthily. And then during the week at the Masses, at least a hundred times at each one of those weekday Masses, Monday through Friday, the priest says those same words to our students and faculty here. It may well happen that the priest says these words a thousand times every week in his life. And that is his wish, too. And so, it is with you when you come to receive our Lord and you hear those words expressed. The priest is asking that God fill your heart with the love for our Lord and the knowledge of his love for you so that there be no room in your heart or in his heart for any taste of that bitterness which has come into the world through sin. So, the bitterness, and um, how does it reconcile the, the situation with the church as it is? Where is the, where is, where, the, they don't have valid mass. They have adultery in that place. They obtained it most likely from an other sect, and they don't have the means to consecrate the altar. They don't have, because they don't have valid episcopate. Episcopal power, that's, that's just because of what they were involved in, in regards to Kelly and so forth. So it's, it's, it's a sham and a deception of the devil. This, and that's why he's struggling for these words. That's why he's just repeating himself and uh, mounting on that, on that sentence the words that he likes to express. But it's not edifying because he's just repeating himself all that over and over. That's the illustration of God is not helping them to, 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 to teach the truth. God is not protecting him in those, from those errors. So he's just struggling and being uh, on guard against making a mistake, a heretical mistake, especially during the sermon. It's just unbearable because what he's saying, because how he says it, and there's no edifying part in it. It's the Spirit of God is not in this person, in other words. But now the, it's worse because those things are more in front of you. They're easier to access. You used to have to wait for it to come onto the television set. Now you just have to turn you on your right computer, yeah. you know, and and uh, uh, or you would have to walk around the block and get the porn magazine. You don't have to do that anymore. 
uh, or you would have to walk around the block and get the porn magazine. You don't have to do that anymore. So, we would like to uh, finalize this. The Church of God, as represented by this Holy Apostolic See of Rome, yes, uh, we are at the, at the point of really realizing that um, that our situation is uh, difficult as it is and that the devil is attacking us on every front and a daily and then uh, people don't want to convert they don't believe that this is truly the church many of them belong to the novice of sect or have relapsed and Many of them are joining these heretics and not realizing that, that they, from one disaster, they come to a new one and it's still outside the church and they don't have chance of salvation with these people. And that's, that this, is, this has been prepared by the enemies of the church for that particular reason, to set up the network of these false fraudulent assemblies that lure those who will start seeking the truth, and that's again the design of the devil, into their assemblies so that they could be tied up in them, collect personal data, and for the future persecution and so forth. And the church is in the catacombs, we actually in our exile. It's, it's this bad. So, uh, we would like to admonish those who have um, not yet come to the understanding that the church cannot be destroyed, but that we are striving for a perfection of the, as it is and sanctification, but that they are people who go to heretics, who will remain inactive, who don't want to help us, obviously, because they are tied up with heretics, so they go and help heretics. Which was self-evident just by uh, looking at this particular publication of the Sandborn, that's a live stream, and they're collecting data on that live stream, collecting money, donations. And it seems like that they are replying questions that those people pose when they supply the money. So, if that's the case, if that, we don't know, obviously, but if that's the case, it's a sacrilege. Because it's like selling the services for donation. Of course, that's, that's the mark of a heretics, obviously. Donations should be done uh, by free will, by the love of God to support the, the church to continue, and not by some kind of answering, for, for answering questions. So, if that's the case, that's a moral, but that's a violation of the canon law, and that's a sacrilege, it's true, obviously. But they, these people don't belong to the church to begin with, so they don't have a problem doing it. They don't fear God's punishment. That's why the same one was safe, able to say things. And we are absolutely certain, because that law says so, a good tree cannot bear evil fruits, and evil tree cannot bear good fruits, therefore by their fruits you shall know them. So, we know that, that we will always find some kind of... Uh, error and heresy in, in their in their uh, statements how what they what they wear for mass so-called mass this is invalid what their places look like those defects that are outright idolatrous as it is and then you can see what this heretic jenkins was saying that he was not capable of producing a defined part in it it was always repeating himself and repeated one sentence after another, just uh, just uh, that's too much bitterness. That's all. There's 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 bitterness, and that's all you get from from that so-called sermon, because that person is stuck in in the, the and he's serving the devil, and God is not helping you. God by withholding that divine grace, the supernatural help normally that people obtain in the in the natural way as it is, uh, and. The, <laughs> making the, by that very fact that our Lord is not helping them to be hidden, they stumble. They they are incapable of 
coherent uh, thought or ideas or, or, or doctrine that the church teaches, they are in, it's incomparable because precisely they don't belong to the church, they are not Catholic. Most of them without all belong one way or another previously with the Novus Ordo sect, including Sam Vaughan, he studied there. Jenkins got some kind of degree, a master's degree in that Novus Ordo sect, he studied in Rome. So they are all part of it, they are all no good. All, all of them, every single one of them, and including the SSPX. We just wait for that moment when they start saying that they will actually go go ahead with that Novus Ordo mockery. But that will be the day that will, yeah, so it's, it's, it's despair. That's the abomination of desolation. Uh, but the church continues, we cannot be destroyed. So that's why we have read the writing of Leo the 13, our process of blessed memory. That should suffice today, as long as, as it is. Uh, God will protect this church and we will continue. And those who will, will, will be with us, they will be helped. And those who will not be with us, they will have the chance the punishment from God that will be very costly and very painful.